Thank you. But, uh, we do have a quorum. So can we get that? Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Move to approve the minutes, council member. Thank you, that's council member Williams. Second. Okay. I'm sorry, Council Member Williams Ken. He is not actually a member of oh, the committee. He's a member right. of the council, but not a member of that's the committee. Right. So we do not yet have a quorum. And thank you, Jarvis. You're making me look really bad this morning. So thank you for that. Um, but nonetheless, Nathan, we've already done the, the role. We've already done the agenda. So at that point, let's move on to the presentation with the conservation districts, please. Thank you, council member. I believe we have a PowerPoint for this item. Coming up in one second. Thank you. Ordinance calendar number 33,131, um, an ordinance to regulate the demolitions in national historic districts. Um, as an overview, um, historically, actually since about 2007, the city council has required um, its approval for certain demolitions. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So in 2007, the city council actually created an advisory committee to provide assistance in determining what demolitions are appropriate in historic districts. However, in 2020, the council decided not to renew this advisory committee layer because um, my understanding, the policy was to simplify and streamline the demolition approval process in these historic districts to facilitate meaningful redevelopment. Lisa, so, can I stop you there for a second? Yes, ma'am. I know you were around then, weren't you? Yes, ma'am. Um, you served under Council Member um, Stacy Head. Can, if you could give a little historical context, my understanding is that this was created because there was some wholesale demolition after Katrina around housing in areas that were not protected. So they kind of fell through the cracks. And it was a very difficult time in terms of oversight and um, just, and, and also at the time, I think there are a lot of people didn't need permits, um, especially for rebuilding. And so there was no safety net out there to ensure that historically appropriate buildings were, were um, not torn down. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That is actually fully correct. Um, the city council, not long after Katrina in 07, um, did not appreciate how there was no overview outside of HDLC and BCC districts, knowing how historic our city is. Um, there was a desire to ensure that there was not just whole cloth demolitions with no review citywide outside of the historic districts. And so right. in 07, they created a layer to um, ensure council review of historic demolitions. Right. I just wanted the public to be aware of that because this was set up at a time that was very different from how we're really trying to look at it now, because now what's actually happened is that it's added more processes and steps and it's actually impeding, um, I feel like it's impeding uh, renovations that could happen more speedily. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you, council member. So with what council member Palmer just provided, that was the basis for redrafting the law that hadn't been majorly reconstituted since 2007. Um, the overall goal of the ordinance is to preserve the structures that have a historic architectural and or neighborhood significance and to promote redevelopment that's historically appropriate. Um, next slide, please. 
So with regards to the new law and impacted properties, um, only certain properties in National Register Historic Districts are subject to council approval process. This is actually the same as the original NCDAC law requiring that certain properties in these historic districts require council approval. So that is remaining the same, that is a status quo. However, we are actually opening up the types of properties that can be demolished without review by adding that it is not required to have a demolition review by the council for structures that did not appear on the 1983 Sanborn maps. So this is a new layer. So basically, the boundaries for the requirements of seeking a demolition with council approval, there is no change. The list of exemptions requiring not having to have council approval, which we'll get to in a second, that is not changing, except we are including one new exception that basically if your structure does not appear on the 1983 Sanborn maps, then you do not have to get a demolition. And if your structure does not appear on the Sanborn maps, that means it didn't exist in 1983. So it basically is ensuring that it was built in the last 37 years. It is not one of historic significance per se. Therefore, they can just go ahead and demolish it outright. And just to reiterate what the list was with the inclusion of the new edition, you do not need to seek council approval if you are already in an HDLC, VCC, or CBD HDLC jurisdiction because those entities will actually determine demolition with appeals rights to the council. If you want to demolish your structure less than 25%, you can do so without going through council approval, except if you're touching the front facade, then can you we, need council can we, can we edit, talk about that for a little bit? Every, it's, it's kind of annoying, but you have to use the word demolish even though it's partial. Yes. But I just want people to, to realize this is we're not talking about demolishing an entire building. Even if you're renovating a small portion of the building, they're using the terminology demolish. So I just want so people don't have heartburn like I do when I see that word. Yeah, and it's a bureaucratic llama thing. It's just the way they style it. Which I which I don't like, but it, it is what it is and we can't fix that. <laughs> So the, an applicant also does not need to seek council approval for a demolition if it's a single story accessory structure that is not visible from the right of way. And um, again, the new one, you do not need approval if your structures are not on the 1983 Sanborn map. And also you do not need to seek council approval when it is a true emergency demolition. On the next slide, this goes through the new process under the new law. Um, just to reiterate, the previous process, an applicant would apply to safety and permits. Safety and permits would determine if council approval was needed. If it was, you would go to an NCDAC hearing. That was that advisory body layer. You have that hearing within 45 days of your application being submitted to safety and permits. And then thereafter, it went to the city council for final determination for either another public hearing or simple ratification. And that had to be done within 60 days of receiving NCDAC's recommendation. So essentially there was a requirement for up to two public hearings, which the length and the delay was causing some issues with redevelopment. So that is the intent of this ordinance is to try to streamline that. So now an applicant will simply go to safety and permits. There will be a uniform demo application and safety and permits will then take that demo application. The law requires a checklist, which we have already drafted and provided to safety and permits to facilitate their review of the documentation to make sure that when they transmit it to the council, it is complete. And they will, they have to transmit the completed application with that checklist indicating that everything is satisfied within five days of its being completed. Next slide, please. After safety and permits transmits this application materials package, the clerk of council will receive it formally on the council agenda. From there, the council has to set up a hearing within 45 days of that receipt. Um, these reports from, excuse me, the application from safety and permits will be received on the agenda, just like communications do from any entity dealing with land use. So it'll be received and then docketed for hearing at the next council meeting. Next slide, please. 
So since we're only going to have one hearing now versus the old law, which required two, we're going to have the Council Research Office, that's my office, prepare a report for the Council that basically serves as an internal bureaucratic layer in lieu of having an advisory committee. So what um, my team will do is we will take the application once it is formally submitted and within that 45 day timeline, we have to create a report and submit the report to the council prior to them acting within that 45 days. I do not anticipate any big holdups with this, but I would like to read into the record just so everybody knows exactly what the law requires the report contains. So we all know what the report will be providing. Based on photographs that will be submitted by the applicant, I will describe the current condition of the structure the reason for the demolition request is provided on the application and the cause for the current condition of the structure, if it can be determined. The architectural and historical significance of the structure with myself and my team working in consultation with HDLC. The neighborhood context of the structure and the overall effect the demolition will have on the block face and the surrounding area. This can be done by a simple drive by and photos of the area. The proposed length of time the site is anticipated to remain undeveloped if demolition is granted, and this is based on the application materials. And are there proposed plans for redevelopment? If so, do the plans appear to comply with all zoning laws, or will additional entitlements be needed? And that will be determined by myself working in consultations with City Planning Commission and the Department of Safety and Permits. So ultimately, what the Council will receive is the application package with a report that kind of dissects it and streamlines the information the Council needs to make an informed decision on approving or denying demolition. Next slide, please. Ooh, well, my slides are all messed up. Sorry about that. Okay, step four. So then the council will consider the demolition request. So once the report is received from the council research office, the district council office will then consider it at a public hearing and approve or deny by motion. So this is very similar to the existing process, how approvals and denials are done by motion. Um, Consistent with the existing law, the approvals may contain reasonable conditions, such as requiring the demolition or the redevelopment be done in a certain time frame, or requiring certain historic elements be salvaged. This is done at the election of the council. And the failure for the council to act um, within 45 days will be deemed a denial. In the current law, it is 60 days for the city council to act. So with this document, we are shortening it from 60 days to 45 days, again, to facilitate the redevelopment. And we are only, having one layer of approval versus two public hearings, also streamlining and taking away that initial 45 days. So we've condensed it down from an um, initial one up to 105 day process down to a 45 day process, which we're really hoping will benefit the public. Okay, so, so we're, we're talking about saving potentially, what is that, 45, 100? Months. Almost two months? Hopefully, yeah. And so, um, so the public, the, this is something that I really want to focus on with the council. There, there are a lot of barriers to housing production, and this is one of them. And when we talk about the importance of affordable housing. Part of that is housing production and the ability to produce more units. Adding an additional two months approval time on any project is two months of financing from a bank, is two months of not having folks working, um, and two months short of getting another house on the market. So, so we really need to start focusing on ways that are smart, that we can still make sure that the fabric of our community is protected, but also that we have the ability to renovate properties and to incentive, incentivate, um, incentivize, excuse me, I should say, um, builders and renovators to go in and renovate properties and homeowners. And so that homeowners themselves also don't have to wait, you know, six months, what have, what have you, to, to renovate and get a permit. Next slide, please. So we also clarified the law. There's nothing new here. Um, we just went ahead and kept the law, the existing, can't even talk, kept the existing law the same, excuse me. So the existing requirements for illegal demolitions are all gonna remain in place if you demolish um, impermissibly, there is a 15% fee um, on the building value, and the fee can be appealed, this 15% fee, to the City Council within 30 days. Um, 
There is additional fees that may be contemplated by the city within the Department of Safety and Permits. Um, these are found in the building code, and I'll get to those in a second because we're actually having a formal amendment to that fact. Next slide, please. So there are two amendments proposed to the ordinance that is currently lying over um, and is be considered on Thursday. The first one simply provides exactly the expectation the council has for the application form. This was done after consulting with, and I wanna thank uh, council member Banks and council member Palmer's staffs. So they've been wonderful to work with and they've been working really hard with me on this. And also the Department of Safety and Permits, um, Elizabeth Ballard in particular, she's been very helpful. And what we did was we looked at the existing application forms and decided what information was pertinent and appropriate and decided ultimately it is best to codify the application requirements that the council feels is most prudent to ensure that going forward, we will always have them in the law as forms can change as departments leadership changes. We wanted to make sure that in perpetuity, there was certain information. So that is the first amendment, making it very clear that the application form is going to require and nothing's really new here. Generally, it's all the same. We just wanna make sure it'll remain consistent. Owner and application name and contact information. If it is an applicant on behalf of the owner, we just need proof that it is the owner that desires this because not just anybody can demolish your home. Um, property address and the council district. And if that property is an HDLC, BCC or CBD HDLC district, the law makes it clear that safety and permits will be assisting applicants with that um, as not everybody knows what council district or historic district they're in. How long the owner has owned the property, uh, the general reason for the demolition and the proposed cost and future development plans, if any, and plans for securing and maintaining the lot. Um, the application also contemplates the number of residential units to be demolished, and we thought it would be appropriate to have that permanently in the code. So that is the first set of significant amendments is just reiterating what the application requirements will be. The second amendment contemplates the fees section that, that provides that 15% fee if you illegally demolish to simply provide the cross-reference to the building code that I alluded to earlier, which also provides a separate um, fee, excuse me, if you do any work on your home without a permit required by the building code, there is a separate fee of either 100 or 200%, um, not to exceed the building value that can also apply if you illegally demolish. And so it's in addition to the 15%. And that's always been the case. That's always been the law, but um, working with the staff, we thought it was beneficial to include that explicitly in the law. So homeowners are aware there's more than just one potential fee if you illegally demolish. And that's generally the presentation. If I have anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them. Teresa, this is Cindy. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Teresa. Okay, so back onto that piece, it only applies for the HDLC and the BCC area, right? So we're still talking about demolitions that are in those areas. Demolitions and that are, I'm so sorry, council member, go on. No, I was gonna, uh, my question is that that 15% that fee only applies to areas like the HDLC, the BCC area. So that 15% fee does not apply to HDLC and BCC. They actually have separate fees um, that are codified by state law. Um, but this will only apply, that 15% fee only applies if you impermissibly demolish without council permission in the National Register Historic Districts for structures that require council approval. Um, if you're not in that, then you're not going to be subject to that 15% fee if you illegally demolish. You might be subject to the building code one, but that's a safety, that's a separate law that's been on the books for a good while. I'm so sorry, council member, I can't hear you. I'm not. I, I can't hear the council member either. I, I'm not sure if she's still there or not. Um, maybe you could clarify that that 15% fee is only when people demolish, if this is correct, it, it's only when people demolish without a permit. 
Yes, ma'am. Only if it was an NCD neighborhood concert. Well, that's the old law. The National Register of Historic Districts, which are no different in boundaries than what existed under the NCDAC. So like you still have your Garden District 1, you still have your um, whatever the new ones we just did a couple of years back. So like those aren't changing. If you do impermissibly demolish within those and it wasn't a single story, non-visible thing from the right of way, yes, those fees are going to apply because you had to secure, you're getting the fee for not securing council approval. That's everything. That's all I got. If any council members do have subsequent questions. I'm, I'm absolutely happy to help. I, I do not. I, I want to thank you for putting time in this. And I want to thank Councilmember Banks for, ha um, for having this meeting. I just, I know there's been a lot of back and forth on how to progress. And there's been a lot of time spent to really thoughtfully figure out how we want to do this while still protecting the fabric of our neighborhoods. I think this is a good balance. And like I said, it, my hope is that this actually winds up producing more housing units for our city. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Palmer. Thank you for the presentation and we will proceed on with the agenda. Next up is uh, the mayor's office relative to the, uh, the Mardi Gras ordinance. Councilmember, may I speak? I uh, can't see who's that. Oh, of course you can. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. I just want to have a few intro comments before we turn it over to the administration. Um, you know, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to stretch on for the foreseeable future, we are unfortunately confronted by the very real possibility of a different type of Mardi Gras for 2021. While February 16th, 2021, is still four months off. The uncertainty caused by the pandemic has caused many crews to see a significant dip in riders and signing up to a parade and find themselves in a position of being either unable to guarantee that they will have the means to organize a parade um, the way they want it to be organized for this carnival season. Um, as currently written, the Mardi Gras ordinance allows for 30 permits for the main parade routes to be issued per year and gives seniorities to crews um, that have consistently rolled. Choosing not to parade or parade differently in 2021 threatens that seniority, and that might lead to traditional participants losing out in 2022. We do not want to incentivize crew, we, want, we do not want to incentivize crews to parade in 2021 if they're financially unable to or concerned about the public health that impacts their parade. Um, so after speaking with representatives of different organizations and the mayor's office, Councilmember Banks and I have authored an, um, an ordinance to allow crews to opt out of 2021 without risking their seniority for 2022. Um, to be clear, this is not canceling Mardi Gras parades. This is simply a common sense protection that crews may choose to avail themselves of should it become untenable for their organization to participate. It also protects them because within the Mardi Gras ordinance, you have to have a certain number of floats you have to have a certain number of, of elements to your parade. This could also give them the flexibility to change what, the, what they might ride and what it might look like this year. And that to me is more important, right? So we may, we may just have a different looking Mardi Gras. And if we do, and we should be creative about how we approach Mardi Gras, we wanna make sure it does not negatively impact any of our crews moving forward, right? I think we want everybody to participate to the degree that they feel comfortable doing so. So um, I just want to say we believe that this um, this is going to be an easier way to base this conversation around what is the best interest of the city and of the crews. And it may and if it, be, it may become necessary to dispense with um, just for the good of public health, we can continue on. And I think this gives a really good level of discourse for our crews and our riders to make those decisions about moving forward. So with that, I just want to turn it back over to Councilmember Banks. Thank you, ma'am. And just let me echo um, that I want to be clear that this is by no means indicating 
that we are canceling Mardi Gras or anything like that. What this does is it codifies the mayor's statement that crews will not be penalized if they are physically or financially unable to parade. That is this in a nutshell. So we know that the ordinance says what it says. If you don't parade, we also know that uh, we're under disaster. But the fact is we wanted to have it codified to give everyone a comfort level, <coughs> excuse me, to make sure that there would be no no ambiguity, nobody coming. We live in a very litigious society. People sue for everything. We did not want the um, declaration challenge to the detriment of a crew that was not able to parade. Now, um, that's all this does. It by no means, again, is going to cancel or is an indication of canceling. But the reality of COVID is that we know we've got individuals, we know we've got organizations, we know we've got entities that are struggling. And this whole thing about Mardi Gras being the greatest free show on earth, well, it is free for the people standing on the neutral ground or the sidewalk waving their hand saying, throw me something. But for the people that actually are putting on the parades and providing those throws, it is not free. And many of those folks are struggling through this pandemic and we just wanted to make sure that no organization was penalized if they were unable or um, concerned about the health aspects of it with parading. So with that, and I'm going to turn it over to the administration. It might look different too, right? It may have but, less floats or it might have less bands or we don't want to penalize them for that either. All, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the look of Mardi Gras in 2020 is likely to be different than it'll look in 2021. And we just want to make sure that again, no one is 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 under the belief that they're being forced to do something when they can't do it, and if they aren't able to do it, that they will be penalized for not being able to. And that's purely and simply what this does. So, with that, uh, uh, Council Vice President, good morning. Um, and I know we're gonna we do have a quorum now, but um, let's move on to having uh, the presentation from the administration. Or if there is a presentation from the administration. Brian? Yes, good morning. I'm on my mute button there. Good morning, council members. Um, you know, we really appreciate um, working with the council on this. It is a common sense thing, as both of you have said. Um, we have to protect um, our crews and allow them some clarity in their decision-making process. And that's exactly what this ordinance is designed to do. Um, it, it is in the code to you know, protect the crews under extraordinary circumstances and national emergencies. However, we all read city codes all the time and we know that they're confusing to us sometimes. So to expect um, all of our Mardi Gras crews to dissect the code and have any comfort level um, I don't think is realistic. This provides that clarity, that comfort level for them to make the best decisions for their ridership, their crews and everyone involved. So I thank you all for bringing this forward. Um, it, it's, it's very much appreciated. The leadership of the Mayor's Mardi Gras Advisory Council is on the same page. They appreciate it very much. Thank you, any other comments? All right, this will be on first reading at the council's uh, meeting on Thursday. And uh, it'll be first read so the public will have an opportunity to issue any public comments they'd like after we, uh, after we actually introduce it. So with that, uh, we're gonna move on um, to the next portion of the presentation, which is the Small Landlord Assistance Program. And Ms. Uh, Margiana Woolman is going to be the presenter. And I'm really excited about this. I think this is a really good thing to so start. We aren't ready to spike the ball yet, but at least we're in the game. Margiana? Yes. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Let's see. Yes, we can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Trying to get my camera to come on. Okay, thank you so much, um, Council Member Banks, um, for having me here to talk about the program. And um, you're right, and I agree. I think it's a small step in the right direction. Uh, we certainly want to help 
our small landlords, the small mom and pop um, landlords out there, um, that it's always been important, just as it's been important to help tenants who cannot um, pay their rent through the rental assistance program. Um, this program rolled out uh, on last Thursday, um, and it makes available $1.5 million for landlords uh, that own eight or fewer units. And those units have to be um, you know, currently occupied. Um, and those are landlords that are, have fallen behind on their mortgage because they cannot, um, uh, they are not able to uh, get in the rent, rent, the rent payments due to the pandemic, and therefore they have fallen behind on their mortgage. Um, the grant is up to $15,000, and the city will actually pay the past due mortgage payments. Um, we have received about 200 calls just since Thursday, and it looks like about 10% of those um, callers actually would be eligible for the program, just based at first blush, based on what they are saying and the information that they're submitting. So we're very excited about the program. The point of the program was for the city not to lose affordable housing through foreclosure. So we're trying to stabilize housing for our tenants, this program will help tenants and landlords. It'll stabilize um, housing for tenants, but it'll also keep us from losing um, any uh, units to foreclosure. And um, there are landlords that are in risk of foreclosure. We have had several callers also to say, well, I'm not behind on my mortgage payments yet, but I'm, you know, I, it's getting close. I'm worried and I'm afraid. So, um, just because of the amount that we have available right now, we're helping those that have actually fall, fallen behind, but we will check in with those that are saying, you know, it's really close and I'm really worried to find out if they actually do fall behind. We wanna be able to help them as well. So um, again, this program will pay for the mortgage payments. That landlord cannot go after their tenant during that period of time. Um, that we're paying mortgage payments for past due rent. And this program also prevents the landlord from evicting its tenants for non-payment through January 31st. And uh, one of the reasons we came up with that January 31st date was to prevent from continuing to have contributing to that landslide that is expected at the end of the year uh, due to the end of the moratorium. So this will give us another month on some folks give them a little bit more time. So the programs have been well received and we're hoping to get more funds to fund the program and keep going. Thank you. Um, and I wanna emphasize that this is just the beginning. Now, this first effort is for folks that are in foreclosure, but it is hope and intention that we can expand this because even though you've got, you may, you may be in a position where you don't have a mortgage, those small landlords still have insurance, they still have maintenance, they still have property taxes. In many instances, they said had utilities to pay on behalf of the tenants and they were not receiving any rent. So this is just a start with the intention of trying to get it much larger. Affordable housing is something that is absolutely critical to the essence of this city. New Orleans is a magical place, but it's not only magical because it's at this intersection where we're two inches closer to heaven. It's magical because of the people that live here. And if the people that live here cannot afford to live here, we're gonna lose that magic. So with that, anything that we can do to help to balance the scale, we ought to be intentional in doing. So I'm very happy that uh, the administration has heard my begging, pleading, crying, conjoling, pressing, and whatever other adjective you want to use, and have come this far. And I'm going to ask that we continue to go further. So with that, um, any comments from my colleagues? Um, Council Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Marjoriana, this is a, a really great program, and thank you so much for working so diligently on it. Um, I think what's so important about this is that this is a program that's going to incentivize landlords to keep their tenants, which is so key. Um, so my question is, um, I, you may have mentioned this, and I may have missed it. Um, what is the total amount of money that you have available to give out um, for grants, and when will you start giving out those first round of grants? 
Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, so there's $1.5 million available, and it's $15,000 per uh, landlord. And we are working, um, we have received some applications already. We're working with our um, um, finance department. So we would hope to be able to, uh, within the next uh, two weeks, uh, you know, there's going to be time. We have to get in touch with the, the lender, make sure that we have all the documentation, but we're full speed ahead, and we're moving as quickly as possible. So it's per landlord and not per property. So if a landlord, let's say, has three doubles and all three properties are in trouble, they can only apply just themselves, not per each property. Is that correct? Yes, that's the way it is right now. Um, and, and the point of that, again, was so we could help as many landlords as possible. But we are trying very hard to identify other funding sources so that we can um, help landlords even more. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Councilmember Palmer. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Marjana, where does um, the money come from? Which which source? Yes, it, these funds came from the NIF, um, the NIF budget. And um, we did meet with the advisory committee before rolling out the program and we explained to them what we were wanting to do. Um, there was money set aside for a teacher's down payment assistance that we still want to move forward with using another pot of funds, but we're going to kind of switch that out and use this for the landlords. And we're using uh, down payment assistance money that was in disaster funds to move over to the teacher's uh, program. So why can we not um, access CARES Act funding for this? Or is the intent that if we get reimbursement with more CARES Act money, it, it will go back into the NIF? Uh, the is, reason why we, I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm sorry. I, I'm just saying, I mean, the reason we're doing this is because of COVID, right? And because of the issues surrounding COVID. Um, sure. the, we have so many issues around housing and I'm all about putting as much money as possible into <laughs> housing. So um, I, I'm curious if we can refund ourselves from CARES Act money for this. Should we receive more? Sure. So um, we will use CARES Act money as we can for this program, but the CARES Act money does limit the um, eligibility of the landlord. So then we would have to look at the landlord's assets and see, you know, what their income is. With the NIF, we are able to, we know there's a need. So even though they may have, they may not be 80% AMI below. They may be higher, but we do know they have fallen behind on their mortgage because we have checked with the lender. So we have a lot more flexibility with the NIF program in terms of timing, procurement, um, paying out the, the money to the lender than we would with the federal funds. So if we're able to use federal funds, we certainly will. Okay. But I guess what I'm asking is, will the administration reimburse the NIF fund for other housing issues if we get more CARES money that we can utilize with this. For, and for instance, I know that there are some limitations on it, but I also know that there's a lot of money sitting up at the state, right? That yes. they can't yes. get out the door. Right, Ab absolutely. So, and I'm, I'll speak on that as well. So yes, if there's an opportunity to backfill that money or pay the city back, we absolutely will do that. And we're absolutely looking at that. All right, thank you very much. Yes, and if I would just add on the state's rental mm -hmm. assistance program, we have been talking to them and we are um, working on CEA that has been finalized. We're, the Louisiana Housing Corporation has, has signed off on it. They're um, um, going to send it over to us once they sign and we'll begin working with them to help to get those funds out to tenants in New Orleans. Because uh, when we talked to them, I think part of the issue was is they weren't able to get the documentation all the way in Baton Rouge that they needed from tenants. And if we have this local hub here where we can receive those documents, some people do not have access to Wi-Fi uploading documents or the like. So if we can receive those documents here at the Office of Community Development, send them over to LHC, they can make those payments and they're saying they'll make the payments within 24 hours of receiving all the documentation. Council Member Wynn. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Banks. Uh, Margiana, do you, you guys have a number of landlord that you're anticipating to assist with this program? And it, is it a first come first serve base type of process? 
Yes, it is first come first serve until the funds are exhausted and we expect to be able to help 100 uh, landlords, up to 100 landlords, possibly more depending on the award amount. So, but we're, we're aiming at 100. Okay, do we, do we even have data in reference to a num the number of landlord we have in the city of New Orleans? Is there such data available? I, I, I'm not aware of that data. So, okay. um, yeah, I'm not. Um, that's something else that we're working on. Okay. Thank you very much. But Thank Council you, Member Wynn, we, we know that this is truly a drop in the bucket. Yeah. Um, and if we can help 100, that is 100 more than are being helped now. But that is nowhere near where we hope to be. So this is, again, just the start with the intention of trying to find additional resources to expand this universe so that we can really, really, really make an impact. So no, I no means again, are we done? This is just the beginning. I agree with you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, Margiana, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So with that, um, I know that we do have a quorum. So if I could get a motion, please, to adopt the minutes. So moved. Meeting. Thank you. Can I get a second? Got a second from the council vice president. Can I get a roll call, please? Yay. 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 Oh, sorry, I can't hear. <laughs> Thank you. And before we adjourn, I, I want to take this opportunity. This is the Community Development Committee meeting. And I want to acknowledge publicly a stalwart, a giant, a, an icon in this community that recently passed. And it's ironic that we had a conversation about Mardi Gras in this meeting. And I want to publicly acknowledge uh, the contributions of George Rainey, who uh, departed uh, this life a few days ago. And um, this community is far better than what it was before he got here. He has been a true asset, uh, affectionately known as the mayor of Algiers, but an ambassador to the entire world on behalf of New Orleans. And um, George, is going to be uh, funeralized this weekend. He's gonna lie in state at Gallier Hall on Friday from three to seven. And his celebration of life will be Saturday at the St. Stephen's Missionary Baptist Church on um, LB Landry Boulevard over in Algiers. So with that, um, I want to uh, again express uh, my personal sympathy to the family and my personal gratitude to George who I know is listening in heaven for all that he did to help make New Orleans what it is today. So with that, if there are no further comments, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and second, all right. Uh, can we get a roll call on adjournment? Yay. 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 Thank you all. Be safe and continue to wear your mask. Be safe.